good. Good? We are good. Hi, folks. Welcome. We're early. You're late. It always happens. Anyway, the tonight's topic is on table saws. Have we got a question right away? No. So while we're waiting for that to happen, I want to acknowledge a couple things that happened this week. First of all, Al, who is a combat wounded, Canadian combat wounded vet, reti- uh, medically retired as tank commander, brought this to me. So he kept his first shell, his first shell and his last shell that he fired. This was his first. This is a, I think it's 105 mil, 105 millimeter tank shell. So that sits in the front of our, our uh, shop over there. I'm going to turn a big, uh, a big maple bullet for it to complete it. Interesting. Thank you, Al. So I got a book in the mail today. I, I bought it from Ralph Coleman Graham. And I'll show you his picture. I just started reading it, so I, ha- I can't give you a review yet. Just came the other day. Keep my, my spot. So this is Ralph, World War II vet, Air Force. I believe he was a navigator. Radio operator, sorry. And here's what he said to Rob Cosman, to my number one Canadian fan. Hope you enjoy it, Ralph. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. I will. It uh, has to do with the Battle of the Bulge. So, the other little tidbit for you. Tell me when you got a question. Yep. Uh, we've, we managed to, uh, just in case you're tuning in for the first time, you don't know. So, the building we're in right now is, going, is the building where we're going to house our Purple Heart, our PHP classes. So, this is my shop, and this is, what's the measurements again, Jake? 30... 6 by 24, 36 by 24. Out there, it's going to look a lot better next time you're here, is where the classroom is going to be. And it'll have six, uh, 14 benches. And then um, in the back end, there's a quiet room for the guys that suffer from TBIs that need to lay down once in a while. There's two bathrooms. There's a mess hall on the other side of here because we actually can prepare all the meals here, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then there's the kitchen. So I want to decorate the classroom with things that create the ambiance of uh, hand tool woodworking. And one of them is going to be a collection of wood, uh, Stanley bedrock planes. And in case you're not sure or didn't hear of that before. So the bedrock was Stanley's, what we would call their professional line. They discontinued it sometime in the 1930s. Uh, they started it in the, I think, 1890s. So... There's an, uh, th- so we're trying to complete our collection, and this is my plea for if anybody has the parts we're, we're missing, we'll gladly trade you or buy it from you. So we have a number eight, and in case you didn't know, the bedrocks, uh, for the most of the years, in the very beginning they weren't this way, but uh, I don't remember when it started, but for the most of the time that they were produced, they had a flat shoulder as opposed to a rounded one that you typically see. Uh, I don't have an example to show you. Oh, you do have a you do have a six or five and a half right outside the door. What? That has rounded shoulders. Mm-hmm. An old six or five yeah. and a half, really. Well, anyway, standard bench plane had a rounded shoulder. So we've got the number eight. We got the number seven. We got the number six. We have a five and a half. Luther sent us the number uh, five. And We're, the eight. And the eight. That's right. We're missing a five and a quarter. Very rare. Hard to come by. We found a four and a half, needs a lot of work, but we're going to do it. We had a four, and just this, just this week, this, the uh, number three arrived. Now, it's, it's been broken and welded, but it's still great for what we want it for. And um, who, who? Aaron. Aaron. Aaron found us a number two bedrock. It's got a big chunk out of it, but it, it will complete the collection. So that's on the way. So we're down to just missing the one. And just so that you know, although they never made a bedrock version of it. Where's my one, Jake? I sold it. Probably. Great price. I don't know where you put it. Couldn't resist. It's around here somewhere. But they never did make a number one bedrock. However, we have one original. So if you know of anybody or if you have a five and a quarter, if you hear of it, love to to find out. We've seen a few of them. One or two, but they're terribly expensive. 
Question, Jet Frick. No, nope, waiting on Luther to send them oh back. My. Anything, anything coming don't in on the chat? I notice you don't have it up on the TV. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. All right. Anyway, so tonight's topic is on table saws. Uh, well, here's a question from Jim in the chat. Hi, Jim. And uh, he says, how, I got that one right how long did it take you to make the decision to buy a saw stop? Pardon? Say that again? How long did it take you to make the decision to buy a saw stop? Oh, well, here, I'll, I'll tell you that story. So uh, my first table saw that I ever worked on was a, uh, um, what was that thing called? Uh, is it Shopsmith? No, yeah, Shopsmith. Oh, my goodness. That's, uh, they, they should be outlawed. It was terrible. I didn't know any better. And for a while, I used an old Sears uh, radial arm saw as a table saw where you would turn the motor and rip. It was just, that was a nightmare as well. The first table saw that I bought, I bought a Unisaw, bought it at an auction. I had that for a number of years. In fact, I had that right up until probably 2000. Um, in 2001 or two, I ended up buying 30 four table saws, long story, but I, they, they were mostly unisaws. There was a couple of big 12-inch um, table saws in there, and there were three Wadkin table saws. We actually kept one of those, which is a really nice saw. I was doing the wood show circuit, so I used to do wood shows from Halifax in Nova Scotia to Vic, um, Victoria, British Columbia, which is a lot of land, and a lot of shows in between. And this was when uh, SawStop had only been out about a couple of years. Anyway, they, would set, they were set up not that far from me, and they would be frequently testing the SawStop with a hot dog. People would gather around. Well, I wasn't paying attention. I was doing my own thing. But every time it would set it off, you heard this bang, and it, you would uh, have to check yourself. Anyway, I had kept, purposely kept my kids out of the shop or out of the, away from the table saw, because of the fear that they're going to get hurt. It's, it's a, in fact, I was talking to a fellow on the phone yesterday, calling one of my customers, happens to be an emergency room doctor, and believe it or not, this guy was debating about buying or fixing up an old Unisaw. And when he told me what he did for a living, he said, are you crazy? I said, you, who work with your hands, and he even admitted, he goes, yeah, I've seen my fair share of table saw accidents coming into the emergency room. So by the time we were done, I'm pretty convinced that I had him, I had him uh, embarrassed or <laughs> convinced to buy a saw stop. Anyway, so my fear was that my kids would get hurt on it, so I kept them away from it. And I'd known about it. I'd followed the whole process. Anyway, uh, we did three or four shows back-to-back -back where these guys were set up close enough to me. And finally, on the last show of the year, I just thought, if I don't buy that saw and one of my kids gets hurt, I'll never forgive myself. So I bought it, and we had it shipped home. And to close the story out, the day it arrived, we picked it up, and we brought it home from the shipping company. It was on a steel trailer that we had. It was, pack, it was in a, on a pallet and sitting in the middle of the pallet, and then there was a f uh, sides all the way around the pallet, up about three feet high. And Jake and Mitch Bo were just, Jake and Rex were just little guys. And this thing weighs 600 pounds. So the plan was that we would leave the trailer attached. We would just move the pallet off to the end of the trailer and then get it at the tipping point, tip it down till it touched the, the concrete floor in the, sh in the garage and then slide it out. Well, as we were tipping it, I didn't know it wasn't secured. It came out of the out of the trailer, smacked down onto the concrete floor, flipped up on its top, and I left it there. I said, I'll deal with it tomorrow. Had to take, I took it all apart the next day to make sure that, see what was broken, and there was nothing. And that's when I learned how well these things are made. So um, that's how long it took me. Now we just bought our fourth. One, two, mm. three, four. We, we just recently bought our fourth one. So I wouldn't own anything, but they don't support me. They don't give me anything. Meaning there's no, there is no uh, endorsement here. This is coming from one guy who knows to maybe somebody who doesn't know. That's the only saw to buy. Next question, Frick. Okay, next question comes from uh, Gerald. He's in South Dakota. Hi, Gerald. 
He says, when building a table saw sled, do you use the four cut method to square the fence or you just use a square? The four cut method to square the sled. Well, I actually use, when the last time we did one, um, you can't always rely on sheet goods to become to you square. So it's pretty easy to get one side straight and then rip the other side so it's straight. It's getting that next one square to either of those two that you just ripped. We actually, I uh, have my big 12 inch stare it and we hand planed the end until it was exactly square and then we used the table saw to rip the fourth side so that's how I did it and you always check with your diagonals that if you're going to make the and it's a good question too because if you're going to make a sled it has to be precise everything you do is going to be the quality of it is going to be based off of how well you did that good question next all right and just so you know, Luther's having some issues with his computer. He thinks he picked up a virus, so he's having difficulty COVID? editing the, the questions. But I'm computer trying Computer COVID? I guess. Probably. I'm trying to pick Do some out Do you want to show them here. where Frick is? So we've changed things around <laughs> a little bit. Frick's behind the green screen. Mm -hmm. I hope he's wearing pants because you only see the top half of them. No. Are you wearing pants, nope. Frick? Nope. He actually told me, took my shirt. I'll tell you about that story later. Anyway, that's just... We, we uh, rather than have to move our stuff every time, so this, this is going to have doors on it. That's where Jake's going to keep all his camera equipment. And then that little cubby hole over there is where we're going to store Frick in between the, uh, the two weeks when we're not we even We even left a little hole in the bottom. We did. We left we can, a breathing hole. Where we can slide food in. Yeah. For food and feeding them? I don't think so. Dog food. Next question, Frick. All right. Question I got is from Adrian Abshire. Hi, Adrian. He says, what's the best collection... Best dust collecting system for a saw stop. I have a 1.75 PCS and I love it. Would love something that I can use with smaller cuts. Uh, I'm going to ask you to read that again because I was trying to figure out what some of the, the acronym was. Uh, he says, what's the best dust collection system for a saw stop? He says, I have a 1.75 PCS. Four and three quarter professional. Professional saw stop, yeah. Would love something that I can use with smaller cuts. With smaller yeah, cuts? Mm hmm Hmm. I don't quite understand what you mean, but let me address the first question, which is what's the best dust collector? First of all, th let, uh, remember, there's, there's no... Saw stop's not paying me. I'm, I'm, I'm recommending this to you for the same reason that you would recommend a great restaurant to a friend. This... I, I gotta, in fact, I'll just back up just a little bit. So... I have worked in over 50 woodcraft stores teaching classes. So over the course of 12 years or so of doing that, I got around the country. And I, uh, I also watched with great interest the whole story as this saw stop thing was unfolding. It's an interesting read. They, they got going in the early 2000s and um, had to do it on their own because the manufacturers of other saws, for some reason, all of a sudden weren't interested in their technology. And in case you're not aware of this, if this is running and you accidentally touch that blade, the blade will stop and drop out of sight in the amount of, in, in less time than what it takes for that one of those points to, to uh, cut through with the second layer of skin. So it's essentially you, it's, you cannot be cut on it. I mean, it'll cut you, but it'll, uh, it's nothing more than what a Band-Aid would fix. As soon as you turn on the saw, there is a an isolated six volt current in that blade. And anything that touches that blade that conducts electricity, whether it's flesh or a piece of metal or wet wood, that slight sharing of the current is detected. And down inside there is a, uh, actually I can just show you uh, right here. There's a cartridge underneath inside the uh, blade or inside this saw cabinet. That's what it looks like. So this is a big block of aluminum. This is a 100 pound spring. That's in position. And there's all the computer crap in there. And what happens is that blade, that part of the, this big block of aluminum is only about an eighth of an inch away from the blade. If anything shares electricity, it fires this off. That gets jammed into the blade. It stops it within, I think, one seventh of a rotation. You think about that for a second. If that's spinning at 3,000 RPM, 
how far could you move your hand in the time it takes that saw to go one seventh of a rotation? That's why you don't get cut. What was I talking about? Have you ever triggered it? People want to know. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait. Yes. We're talking about dust collector. Yes, we are. We've got to come back to dust collector. So anyway, so to finish that other story off, so over the years, I would, I would see saw stops becoming more and more prevalent in these stores, and then in the last seven or eight years, that's all they had. Every once in a while, I would go into a Woodcraft store, and there would be a Unisaw or a Powermatic on the floor, and I'd always make a point of asking them. I said, how long has that been there? And they'd go back and look it up, and that's been there for three years. So I, my guess is that these guys outsell everybody else 50 to 1 or more. The only saws that compete with them are saws that are really cheap. And if you're buying a really cheap saw, you're asking for trouble. It's just too light, too dangerous. Um, have we ever tripped it? I'll, I'll ask that last. I'll answer that one after this one. So one of the advantages of a saw stop, now remember, I had a Unisaw. I had the, uh, the uh, Wadkin. Wadkin. And at BYU, I worked on Oliver's. And uh, I can't even remember all the ones. I, worked, I would have worked on a Powermatic there as well. Most of those saws for dust collection, they have a port down there, and you plug your dust, collector in, your dust collecting hose into it, and then you're just essentially drawing air from that great big cavity. So what happens in the dust collecting system, as you shrink the size of the hose, you increase the speed of the air, right? You're pulling a certain amount of air through a hose this big. If you're pulling the same amount of air, but the hose drops down this, this big, the velocity increases, which, from what I know, means you'll be able to carry product a lot better, sawdust, chips, whatever. So when your dust collecting hose comes into this big cavity, the velocity really drops, and there's just a slight draft that you can feel, and it barely pulls out the sawdust. What they did is, if Jake can get in there and look, the, your port is down there, but then from your port, there's a flexible hose, and that flexible hose is attached to this shroud. So when I close the gate like that, my saw blade is, held, is in a, um, what is that, two and a, about a two and a half inch wide shroud that goes from here to here. And what, it, what else, there's something they've done recently that may even improved it, is if you look right there. I can't see it. They can't see it? Too dark? Well, what they did is instead of just having the hose come and then open into this shroud, they closed the end of it off so that there's an even narrower opening now, and it catches all the debris. So your saw's spinning this way, all the debris is coming in and being thrown down there, and because that area has been s reduced... There's even greater velocity, and it does a wonderful job. I mean, that'll still get some stuff up in the air, but not much. Um, now, the best dust collector for it? Uh, the only dust, I've only ever used two dust collectors. I one that I made myself, and the Oneida. And uh, Oneida's made in Oneida, is it in Oneida, Oneida New York? And I love that cyclone, cyclone technology bit where your tub is shaped like a funnel. So as the debris comes in, it starts spinning around and ends up in the, in the garbage can. And less, what, what's the percentage that they say a particulate? It's less than one. Less than 1% of the particulate coming in makes it beyond that container into the actual filter. So it's a great system. I would say buy the Oneida. And even if you can't buy the Oneida, you can make your own. They'll sell you just just the little dust devil they call it which is that cyclone that sits on top they'll of they'll sell you various sizes of yeah, cyclones yeah right you can you can take a vacuum and make it even more efficient so for what that's worth now how many times have we tripped this off well i had a guy that worked for me and you ever notice that once in a while you, your hands move and you don't know where they're going i was working over the, i wasn't in this shop it was in my second to the last shop I was over there at my bench. He was over here. So I was sp spinning full RPM. And he took his hand somehow, and he moved his finger like that into that spinning blade, full RPM. Well, it bang the bang went off. Just knowing what had happened was enough to, uh, to uh, not only startle me, but rattle my nerves. I, I left. I couldn't handle the rest of the day. 
But he went over, got a cap, got a Band-Aid out of the cabinet, put it over the end of his finger. It, I don't even think it, it didn't leave, bleed a drop of blood. It just cut through the first layer of skin. And just to protect that, he put a Band-Aid on. I touched it myself. I had the blade tilted at a 45-degree angle. We were cutting, we were making wooden dowel for our wood hinge dowel box. And I was taking this. When we make this, we take dowel that's a little, uh, pardon me, we take stock that's a little better than quarter by quarter. The blade's at a 45, and we're running it through, knocking off that bottom corner to turn that into an octagon. The blade is bar hardly up, and I stupidly did this, but I, ran, I held my hand right there to keep it tight to the fence, just enough to touch the end of the blade. And I fired. It, it cut through one layer of skin, and that was it. I think those are the only two times, those are the only two times that anybody has tripped it with fingers, but it's been tripped with metal. It's been tripped with a wet piece of wood. Ever been tripped with MDF? Nope. Someone asked that. Nope. But it's, uh, we had, we've had some bad cartridges where Dave and I actually had put a new one in and we turned the saw on and bang, it fired off without anything being anywhere near it. Uh, you can also trip it too if you ask, oh, that's, that's right too. Remember that time? So this thing back here, your splitter, uh, I, the splitter, the nut or bolt was loose or something, and that managed to get, something happened that that got close enough, and that tripped it. I don't remember all the details on that, but small price to pay. If you live in the United States or anywhere else where you have to pay for your health care and you lose a digit, that makes these really cheap. Next question, Frick. All right. Next question comes from Chuck Hall. Hi, Chuck. He says, what brand, size, and type of saw blade are you using? Oh, you know what? I got that out because I wanted to, I wanted to show you. So over in our other shop, we have how many blades do we have over there? 60? Eh, it's an exaggeration, but 30 to 40 for sure. 30 to 40? I have... Um, I have Systematic, I have Forest, saw stop. I have Saw Stop Blades, I have Freud, um, there's probably another uh, three or four, a, uh, Simons. The black one, Gudo. Uh, Gudo, Gudo. So I probably have a total of six, possibly ten different brands over there. The, probably the least expensive are these. Again, they don't support me. I don't, I don't ask for their support. These are the best. Uh, I've got forest, the, the forest blades have always been talked about as being the very best you could get. I bought one, couldn't tell any difference. So what I like to use are the thin kerf, in case you're unfamiliar with that. Um, a normal saw blade, 10 inch saw blade is an eighth of an inch. Well, the saw plate's not an eighth of an inch, but the carbide is an eighth of an inch thick. So whenever you make a cut, you're losing an eighth of an inch of material. So it doesn't take very much to add up. The other problem is that you're also having to have, you're pushing, a, you're processing an eighth of an inch of material, which takes a certain amount of torque to get through the piece of wood. The thin kerf are five thir three thirty seconds which means less horsepower to make the same cut. I've never had a problem with it uh, running out, but SawStop provides you with some pretty big washers. You can buy even bigger ones if you need. So we typically have a thin curve rip. Now the nice thing about a rip is that it leaves a flat curve. Um, yeah, a flat curve. See how the tops of all the teeth are flat? And if you're ripping wood, cutting parallel to the grain, it'll do it much faster. We use a cro we have a really fine uh, 80 tooth, Jake, mm. 80 tooth cross cut. So these teeth, every one is pointing in the opposite direction. And if you're cutting plywood, or particle board, or making a cross cut on solid stock, it does a wonderful job. And that's the same. That's the same there. I don't use a combination blade. I'll actually take the time to switch these out just because of the way they perform. But these red 
painted Freud blades for the price that they are, are probably the best deal in saw blades that I have found. I've, um, I, don't, I don't think you're ever going to buy a saw blade that is going to give you a surface that you can glue to. They sell them, they call glue line rips. I don't believe that. I think if you want a really good glue joint, you need to do more preparation than just run it through that. And uh, I, do, I would do that whether it's building a dog house or whether it's building a piece of furniture. Okay, next, Rick. Uh, Brian Proffer wants to know. Hey, Brian. Baltic Birch. Brian's or in Texas? Uh, it doesn't say, but. I think so. I know Brian. We met him down in Florida. Baltic Birch or MDF no? for crosscut sled base, which is preferred? Sorry, Jake and I were arguing. Say that, read that again, please. Baltic Birch or MDF for crosscut sled base, which is preferred? Oh, oh uh, MDF. Yeah, Baltic Birch is notoriously not flat. I mean, it's probably be it's better than the cheaper plywoods, but ply but MDF is going to be a lot flatter than Baltic Birch. Now we we make we make our shooting boards out of both, but the main part of the shooting board is MDF. Baltic Birch sits on top of it. But I know when we process the Baltic Birch, this does not stay flat. So I wouldn't I wouldn't build I wouldn't build any of my jigs or fixtures out of Baltic Birch if I needed something to stay nice and flat. Always MDF. Next, Frick. Okay, so Chicken Hawk, I'm assuming that's a username, wants to know if you can cover ways to avoid kickback. Yeah, real easy. So most people refer to kickback. There's a couple of things. I used to, I used to be the, uh, the uh, lab assistant and then the teaching assistant at BYU. So that means that they would have open labs, which simply meant that the students or the public that were auditing a class could come in and use the shop and I was the one supervising. So every semester you'd have three or four of these <coughs> high speed frisbees. I'm just looking for a piece of, here, right here. This is what I want. <coughs> <coughs> high speed <coughs> frisbees going through the shop and you would learn that as soon as you heard the noise, you would duck, don't look and try to find it first. So here's what would happen. First of all, they didn't have splitters. For whatever reason, they didn't have splitters. So I'm going to take that out. And some will call it a riving knife. I call it a splitter, whatever. So this is the biggest reason for kickback. So they're pushing this through. Now, the, the rule that we always use is you want more surface area here than you have across here. In other words, with this piece of wood, it would be okay to do this. It's not okay to do that. To do this, you should have a miter gauge. If you're lots of experience, I'll, uh, I'll, I won't argue with you. But here's what would happen. When you're pushing a board, I'm going to go out here a little bit farther. When you're pushing a piece of wood through like this, you've got a lot of force from the saw blade pushing the saw like this. So when you're doing it, you need to have your line of force needs to be like this. You're going in that direction, keeping that tight to the fence. I always tell people, I said, don't, you know where the blade is, know where your hand is, pay attention to what's going on over here. Because the second you start to lose control and this wins, what happens is, as it moves over like this, so you're partway through the cut, the blade ends up into here and that catches it and moves it over like that. And then the saw rips a big C on the back and it flings that thing across the shop. And I've seen more p those pieces go flying and hit the wall and smash. I never saw anybody, oh, I did see one big tall guy get hit one time. He was the wrong height, if you know what I mean. He laid there on the floor and turned several shades of green and yellow. I didn't ask to see the wound, but anyway. So that's, how do you avoid that? Well, you have a splitter for one. And what the splitter does, it's close to the blade, so you want to have it properly positioned so that it functions, does its job. When you're, when you're cutting now, that won't allow that piece of wood to cross the path of the blade on the back side and get thrown back at you. The other, uh, actually, before I, before I go to the next one, I'll also reemphasize this. If you have more surface area across here, then you have registering against the fence, then use a miter gauge. Not a huge fan of miter gauges, 
but there's applications where they're necessary. And you always want to make sure they're square. And you can't always trust that when you set it down and picked it up again, especially here where somebody else may come along and use it. So I always check it. If I know that this is square, I will approach it with it loose, move it into place, put it tight against this, and then snug it up. And you want a good miter gauge too. Unfortunately, saw stop does not make a good miter gauge. So lots of support here. Now, the next reason for kickback is typically when you're ripping a piece of wood, we'll talk about solid wood now. If you're ripping a piece of wood, and remember there's always going to be stress inside a piece of wood. So as you're running the blade through and you're disturbing that stress, the wood starts to close in on the blade and in the process of doing it, closing in on the blade is wanting to fire it back at you. Another good reason to have a splitter because that won't allow that blade to close in tight. Pardon me, that won't allow the wood to close in tight on the blade and fire it back at you. And uh, the other thing too is you, gotta, you, you, can't, you can't be running this stuff, you know, you're afraid and you're standing back here using your fingertips. You gotta show it's who's boss. So make sure that this surface is flat and it registers perfectly on the table. Make sure that this surface is straight so that it is registering perfectly up against the fence. If you're trying to rip a rough piece of wood that's not laying flat and it's part of it sticking up in the air, as soon as the resistance from that blade grabs a hold of it, it's gonna wanna drive it down like that and that's gonna squeeze it into the blade and something's gonna happen. If, you're not, if you not, do not have a straight edge along the fence and it's, tip, it's rocking like this, another accident waiting to happen. So you have to have a flat surface. You have to have a straight edge. This one doesn't have to be, but that one does. And stay in control. Know where the blade is at all times. You notice that I don't use any kind of a shroud over this. And Dale Nish, who uh, was my mentor at BYU, we always had to have the uh, guards sitting under there in case OSHA showed up. He quickly put them back on. But his philosophy that I subscribed to was, if you see the blade, you know what to avoid. The minute you put a shroud over that, the, the danger is no longer is not as apparent because you don't see that spinning blade wanting to eat your fingers. And that's when people end up sticking their finger underneath it accidentally. See the blade, know where it is, avoid it. Don't have the blade excessively high. I'd probably cut more like that. And I try not to be lazy. And I try to take, remember to take the time to adjust the blade height. So be firm, know what you're doing, make sure you've got that checklist that I just told you about. And that's probably the single biggest difference maker right there. So if your saw doesn't have one of these, get rid of that saw and get one that does. It's that big of a deal. That's a really good question. I'm glad we had the opportunity to talk about it. I don't bring it up enough. You get very comfortable after something you've used for so many years. And you got to remember, you got to constantly go back and remind yourself it's extremely dangerous, even a saw stop. Now, it may not cut you, it can fire a piece of wood back at you if you don't follow those, those uh, tidbits. What's the matter? Are we out? No. Oh, we're talking to this camera now? <coughs> Next one, Frick. Did you want to talk about anything else? Take a little yeah, break? Yeah, I do. I, I, uh, I want to mention, so we have moose here. Huh? Don't go anywhere? Oh. Jake's readjusting. So are you coming back? So I need to be able to move. Moose is here. <laughs> he can't say hi because he can't move that camera. We'll hold that one. So let me remind you that tonight we're giving away some prizes. We always do. In fact, I'll bring it over here. So we use these Saturday night fireside chats as a way of raising awareness of our Purple Heart Project and also as a way of giving you the opportunity to participate. You know what, I'll say it, we don't need your money. We don't need your money, but, and that's because we've already figured this out, we would gladly pay for it ourselves. If you wanna feel good about doing something, step into my shoes and participate in one of these week-long classes with these combat wounded vets and you will be forever changed. I recognize that not everybody can do that, but you can be a part of it. And if you want to support one of these men or women that we bring into this class, then by all means, 
you are welcome to. You can donate, and we will use those funds for that purpose, just so that you know. We fly them in. We put them up in a hotel, and it's a nice one. And by the way, I should mention, what, what the name of the hotel we use is the uh, Travel Lodge in St. John, New Brunswick. And uh, the manager I sat down with, they give us an incredible rate. The first manager I sat down with, his brother actually had two tours in Afghanistan, and he was a mess as a result of it. So he said, Rob, I'll help you. And he went to bat with the, uh, with the higher-ups, and they came back with a proposal, and he said, that's not good enough. And he went back and got another one. And it's almost, it's almost free. Fantastic. And they, they so appreciate us going there, and we so appreciate what they do. So we cover their hotel. We feed them, and we feed them the very best. We're not on rations. We have lobster. We have uh, Frick always smokes a brisket. We feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And this now we're going to be doing it right here. So we feed them well. We send every vet home with enough tools to go home and build furniture. It turns out to be somewhere between $3,500 and $4,000 worth of tools. And thanks to my, uh, my good friend Jack Lane down in Texas and Chris Chahusky, yeah. Chahusky, those two gentlemen uh, run our bench brigade. And we're going to have Chris on. And Chris, I apologize. I haven't took, uh, met up with you on the phone, but we're going to. We're going to have him. Chris is going to come on and tell you what it's like to be on that side of it because he does this for the same reason Jack does it, who does it for the same reason that I do it. These folks help uh, rally the troops, only this time the troops are on the civilian side. And what we do is we provide a bench, a ready-to-use bench, good solid bench, same benches that we have here, for every one of these combat wounded vets that come to our class. We're actually trying to get benches built for the vets that have been to our previous classes that we had before we started the bench brigade. Civilians who want to participate, uh, contact me. I send your name to Jack, and that will allow you to procure the materials. We'll provide you with the vice. And Jack will pair you up with a, one of the vets that's coming to our class or has been in our class that's closest to you so you can actually deliver it personally. And you build the bench. We provide you with the plans. And uh, there's some fantastic stories that have come out of that. I think we're up to 32 or 33 that have been built and delivered. COVID, of course, has thrown a monkey wrench. We haven't been able to have a class since fall of 2019. So we lost all of 2020. And we've got our fingers crossed that something's going to happen positive for 2021. So the minute they open the border, we're going to do two a month instead of one a month, and we're going to do them for as long as the weather will hold out, and we can, uh, we can get, try to get caught up. So if you're going to donate, instead of giving a bunch of money away to uh, these companies that do this type of thing, Luther and Jake built, uh, built a page on our site. You go into robcosman.com, right up at the top on the left-hand side, PHP, Look down in there, it's how can I help, and it'll tell you how you can donate, and um, you're welcome to it. You're welcome to it. And the people have done it, they understand, they get it. So, to give back something to you, we will, uh, for every thousand dollars that gets donated, we give away a prize, and Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus finance the prizes, and Santa Claus is uh, well on the way to being over covid and my brother Randy uh, just is just just barely getting over it, and it was it really knocked the wind out of his sails. But he's on the mend. So tonight we're going to give away a couple of interesting prizes. We uh, we did a we did a, a where are we now? Your camera, that camera? No, we can go to the main one. What one? Jake's. I'm on Jake's. Yeah. We did a video that will be released this coming week, comparing a Luban plane that's sold in Europe to a Wood River. They're both number sixes. And the questions have been, is it the same plane? So Jake bought one. Um, we compared it. I'll wait and you can see the video. But Ken did it all up for us, Ken Anthony. So it's ready to go. Uh, it's all pressed, all dressed, just as if you took it off my bench. There's only one little issue with it, and that's the lateral adjustment lever I'm not a fan of, but it's fully functional. Ken made sure of that. So we're going to give that away tonight. We're going to, and then for every $1,000 after that, we're going to give away one of our Trend Diamond Plates. And this is part of the kit that we recommend. This is part of what we give the vets that oh, steal. Just a second. What's the matter? I lost Jake's signal. 
Does that mean no audio or no video? Or no, we got, we, I just went to the other camera. Okay, so I can keep talking? Yeah. Anyway, so that diamond plate is, what's really great about that, and here's your commercial, if you haven't got a sharpening system and you, you like what I use, but you haven't got the $500 to buy the whole thing right now, you can start with just that. And it's got a 1,000 grit side and a 300 grit side. And the 1,000 grit side will actually give you an edge that you can use on softwood, and it'll work, and it'll work quite well. We've often demonstrated that. When you're ready to get the other pieces that bring you up to 16,000 grit, which is what you're going to want if you don't want to have to sand your hardwoods, meaning you can finish it that well, then you're just adding pieces to it. You're not having to replace anything. So you can get started with this one and then add to it as time goes. And with each, with each video, we'll give you one of our new T-shirts. Angie's been hard at work. Angie and Lynn have been pressing these and packaging them for us. That's the new uh, Rob Cosman, my hand tool coach. So a t-shirt will go out with each one of those, as well as a video that talking with the topic. Speaking of t-shirts, so over here, this distinguished gentleman with the uh, snow on top is Moose, Bruce McLeod. Bruce and his wife have, uh, have a business in our city market. Our city market is the oldest Still operating, um, what kind of market they call it? Farmer's market. Farmer's market in Canada. It was built in 18... It's over, over 140 years, going on 150 years now. Oh, it's a 150-year-old market. And it's on a, it's a side of a hill, so Moose spends uh, most of his life a little twisted. Yeah, that could be where it came from. <laughs> anyway, so Moose has been very, very kind. He is the... the uh, the purveyor, is that the word I would use? The purveyor of the dead cat? So we've been giving away dead cat sweaters. People love them. In fact, Moose said he had a young girl come in today. Was it today? She's going to a... Last, last night. So. Last night. Yeah. So she's going to a... It's still kind of cool here. She's going to a bonfire. And she was so excited about getting one of these because that actually makes me think of a bonfire. The, this, this is the warmest garment I've ever worn. Chris... Chris uh, um, Chris uh, Davenport. Davenport up in Fredericton, he bought his, and he texted me later that day, and he said, is there a heater in this thing? They're that warm. And Moose and the guy that supplies the stuff did the work and, made, and added the Purple Heart logo to it. And then Moose was saying to me the other day, he says, you know, Rob, we should do something a little different for the warmer season. So Moose just came up with these really nice uh, blue uh, golf shirts that have the same logo on it. He's wearing one tonight. I was supposed to, but Frick snagged it. He's modeling it. He is modeling it. So tonight when we draw, <laughs> we'll give you your option of either the golf shirt or the dead cat. You just tell us which size you want and which one you want and we'll set you up. So we're gonna give away three of those tonight. We've also got our t-shirts that have our wood slogans that have our Purple Heart logo on them. Wood, is, wood doing good, wood is good, and wood for good. And Angie and Lynn package those up for us. Then we've got our new merchandise, our hoodies, our T-shirts, our golf shirts, our hats are coming. And I'll let you guess whether or not I'm doing a commercial for Perrier or for my own mug. You know I don't swear. You shouldn't either. Don't embarrass your mother. If you can't control your tongue, what else can you... So, ah, oh shoot. I think that was Frick's idea. Well, actually, I think it was someone on our live episode one time. Because you say it so much when you make a yes. mistake. Which is, which he, what he means by that is I make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So if I did cuss, the air would be blue in here. So you can get yourself an ah, oh shoot mug. Okay, back to the questions. All right, let's take a question from our good friend Sue B. in Florida. Hello, Sue. Sorry we're not there. Maybe next year. We are very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Megan's crying. Frick's been depressed for very, at least a year. Very. <laughs> Even Luke. Yeah. Just, we go to, I teach down in Florida usually in, in February or March, and to uh, spend whatever money I might possibly make, my uh, wife <clears throat> and Frick <laughs> connive and um, rent a uh, mansion, and then they stay <laughs> there for a month. Anyway. That's where I met Sue. Can't wait to go back to that little chicken joint that we went to. It was fantastic. 
Go ahead, sir. What's your question? She says, should you always try to have the off-cut piece to the outside of the blade as opposed to trapped between the blade and the fence? Okay, so a good question. Let's, let's show this. So the rule typically is if you're ripping, you always want to have your keeper piece between the, fan, the blade and the fence. So your waist is going to be on the outside. If you're, if you're cutting pieces to length, you can't do this. You can't have a miter gauge, move that over and make that cut. Why? Well, the minute it disconnects, that's gonna become a square bullet and it's gonna head back there somewhere. So you always have to have something supporting it or pushing it through. Or something back here, uh, see if I can come up with an example. If you had some way of securing something like this, so you could come in, move it like that, and then go through. Now there's no way it's gonna get trapped in here. And make sure it's far enough away that even if it turns on an angle like that, it's not going to get trapped. People see me using my sled, which is a little different story. So when I have my big sled on here, I haven't made a new sled for this saw yet, that's why I haven't got it. I often use my fence for multiple cuts, but the sled is moving the entire piece. I'm holding, the piece like this with the fence at the back of the sled and I'm going through and there's no problem at all, none whatsoever because it's fully supported. It's going all the way through. So always make sure that anything between the blade and the fence is well supported. Something's pushing it through. It can't be left in there to be turned into a missile. Okay. Next. Um, what? You also, you I typically. I thought I might have forgot something there. What? You typically will have, will wind up leaving the the waste piece from a rabbit when you're yeah, cutting so a rabbit. Yeah, so I, I knew there was something I was missing. So if you're going to cut a rebate or a rabbit, so if I wanted to remove, if I wanted to remove this, the safest way would be first pass. First pass would be like this. Drop my, drop my saw down. First pass would be there. That would make this cut. And then the last pass would be up like this. Move your fence over. Make your pass. Now your waist is out here. If you were to do it this way, and that piece gets left in there, again, that becomes a potential missile to get fired back behind you. So you always want to have it, if at all possible, you want that waste piece that's going to drop off to be on the outside or on this case on the left side of the blade. Occasionally, sometimes. occasionally I don't do that for whatever reason and sometimes it's in there but you know what? That really does an amazing job of not allowing it to get caught on that blade and fired back. And if it's a little wee thin piece I'm not terribly worried about it. Sometimes there's a situation where I can't help it. What I'll do is I'll go in I'll go in, I'll make a cut so that it's almost all the way through, but it's still holding onto it. Then I'll just break that piece off, raise the blade up a little bit more, and finish the cut. So now the little sliver that's in there is not going to be of any danger. Good question, Sue. All right, next one comes from Adrian Abshire. Hi, Adrian. He says, how do you safely cut an angle like a 45 degree on plywood slash hardwood? It always scares me when I try because the blade is pinching the wood. Yeah, so that, that's something that's really weird. Saw, st um, saw stop tilts away from the fence. Unisaw, which was the industry standard for years, and I think maybe even General does it, their blades were always tilted into the fence. So if you were trying to cut a miter on something, you're right, that triangular piece of wood is going to be trapped in there and it becomes the missile, which is another reason for a, stop, a saw stop. The blade tilts away, so again, that, that piece that gets left over isn't being wedged between a spinning blade and a stationary piece like the fence. So it's much safer. But you know what? Uh, if you have a, a really sharp blade, you always want your blade to be sharp because it, it uses, has less resistance required and it's not gonna give that jamming effect. You wanna make sure that your fence, we didn't talk much about the fence. Uh, I wanna, this is the Beesmeyer fence was developed by a fellow in, I believe he's in Arizona. The patent has long since run out. 
but it's the simplest. And how often is it that the best solution usually was the simplest solution? So the Beesmeyer fence is nothing more than a T-square, really ruggedly built. And at the front of your saw, you've got a big, heavy piece of angle iron. And that is, uh, I don't think it's a quarter of an inch, but it must be three sixteenths. No, oh, it is. It is quarter by quarter. It's a quarter inch piece. So that's bent and that's bolted to the front of your fence. So in other words, it's rigid. It's not going to flex. You've got a fairly heavy tube. So this is a metal tube that's attached in the underside and your fence, and it's very rugged as well. I'll turn it over so you can see. There's a metal, a piece of metal tube that's an eighth of an inch thick. And that metal tube is heavily welded onto this quarter inch thick piece of angle iron. And that sits down in this groove, the space between this rectangular tube and this heavy angle iron. And then there's a contact point out here. And when you push down on that lever or lever, it pulls this in tight. There's two contact points on the underside of this. If it was touching over the whole distance, it wouldn't be nearly as effective. But because there's a contact point right under here and one under there, that makes that really rigid. So I always want my fence set up so that in the, in the lock position, it's just a little bit off of being parallel to the blade. In other words, if it were parallel to the blade, you often have the teeth coming up on the back side and it's going to be scoring your board. So I have it so that this is just flared ever so slightly, just so that as you push through, the back, the teeth coming up this way are clearing the end of that board. So if you've got a really good rigid fence, sharp blade, there shouldn't be any reason to fear making any kind of a cut. And I'll reemphasize what I said. Providing your piece of wood has got a flat surface that's sitting securely on your bench top and you've got a straight edge that is securely held against the side I of lost, the fence. Uh, I lost Jake's signal again. You did? Yeah. Yeah, we have audio, but we yeah, don't yeah. have... Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, there we're we go. We're back? Well, we're on the second camera. Okay, next question. Um, Jake Carolla and Pete Andrews are here. Hey, Jake. Pete? So Jake Tirola... Just got his new, uh, just got his new goalie mask done up. <laughs> Moose has already picked some spots where he plans to put a little black rubber. If you ever get back up here, so Jake Tirola, uh, Jake was a forward observer. Now that's a tough job. So let me just tell you, because he told me, a forward observer means you're right out there near the enemy, and you're calling in airstrikes. You're caught talking to your artillery and saying. Drop this ordinance right here. And I remember asking Jake one time, I said, I said, how close would you dare get? And he said, it depends on who's firing it. So obviously there's a little bond of trust there that is very critical, but wow. And Jake's got a fantastic story. Jake has seven children? Eight. Seven. Okay, come on. I got 10. What's the matter with you? Anyway, he's working on it. Super guy. Jake, Jake received the guitar that the East Tennessee, East Tennessee Luthiers Guild built for us. So we haven't heard that yet. Anyway, um, so we make, I have hockey sweaters because I sponsor Pickup Hockey and I have the name of each vet that's been to our class on the back of the sweater. And Moose proudly wears Jake's sweater. And Pete Ambrose. What can I say about Pete Ambrose? What a guy. Pete. Pete left, an, uh, Pete left an impression on me that will remain with me. Have we got audio? No, we lost, like, the entire internet. Yeah. Okay, no, we're back on. Okay, go. What's going on, Frick? This is all new. So how much of it did not hear? I see Sean on there. Yeah, Sean's here, and so is Joe Bright. Okay, well, I've got to talk about all these guys. So, so Pete, um, Pete, is Pete from Louisiana or from Alabama? Mississippi. Mississippi. <laughs> it's all in the same place. From oh. United, Pete's from the United States. <laughs> Pete Ambrose. He is the most creative dovetailer we've ever had. And I'll leave it at that. Pete, good to see you. Um, Pete built his own bench, too. Pete built his own bench before we got around to building one for him. Lost part of his thumb, but... When? Well, he lost some part of a finger when he was building his bench. Oh, did he? 
that's a tough, big sacrifice I think for a bench. So. I remember. Now, so Sean McDermott. Sean, Sean and I have a really interesting bond. Wow. Um, that's, a, that's a tough story to tell. So I'm, I'm going to skip it. But Sean knows. I remember standing in that grocery store for 45 minutes talking to Sean on the phone. Um, Sean is the... Uh, Sean is the, uh, we're going to call him the inventor. He is the inventor of the Sean Shim. Now, this is a device. We're teaching the class. Sean was in our second class. Second? Yeah. Second class. And Sean came up with this idea. Instead of using the marking gauge to offset the tailboard over the pinboard when you're cutting dovetails. So we've developed it into a product. Where are we? Are we close? We're not close? Why are we not close? I don't know. I thought we, we've already seen the prototype. I don't know. Uh, anyway, the Sean Shim will make its debut, I hopefully soon. Eventually. And, and Joe, Joe uh, Bright. Joe Bright. So Joe went to dinner with uh, Luther the other day. Joe Bright is a certified hero. I read his commendation. Joe ran through, well, he actually risked his own life. There's a bunch of soldiers that were sleeping in a truck. And there was, a ga there was a gas cloud, and it was blowing towards them. And in his attempt to go and alert them, on, well, while escaping it, he f tripped on a rock or something and ended up inhaling it and had, I think, 50% of the interior of his lung was burned as a result. So Joe, and Joe's helped me tremendously with Jesse. Joe's just a fantastic guy. Joe, brother. Jake uh, says to mark it up, Moose. Mark it up? Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Actually, Jake's, uh, Jake's, uh, Jake's an impressive forward, never mind a goaltender. Or maybe he's a lousy goaltender and a good forward. If he doesn't get here soon, I won't be able to lift the puck that high. Yeah. Might have to have you lay down on the ice. Anybody else? No, but Pete did, did say he lost the tip of his right thumb. You don't get those things back, Pete. I don't know what you're doing messing with. Get yourself a saw stop. <laughs> Holy Toledo. What did I teach you? I taught you hand tools. That's right. Next, Rick. All right. Uh, next question is from Steve. Hi, hey Steve. Where's Steve from? Doesn't say. He says, what outfeed table do you recommend, and does the open top on the saw stop table limit its use? Well, so, Steve, I, we've done, uh, we got quite a bit of experience with this. I think the very first one, most people who have a, uh, a commercial shop will end up building a large table around the table. So I worked most of my career by myself. And uh, some of the things I think back that I did is wonder I have any back left. But if you're handling a sheet of plywood or a sheet of MDF by yourself, if you just have your table, that's not enough. This thing is, that thing is going to get to the point where you cannot control the last 18 inches of that cut because of the pressure of that thing dropping down. You have to have something out there. So what we would do is we would just build this into a much bigger table, which gave you lots of room to manipulate stuff. Um, they do make roller stands. I'm not a huge fan of those. Uh, I tried making my own flip up table. We actually videotaped that and that turned out to be not so great because the supports were no good. So was your right idea to buy this? Yep. So it was Jake's idea to spend more money so he bought this, and actually, uh, it was, it, when, you, when it came in the box, it was, oh my goodness, there's more pieces and tubes and holes. Finally got it together, but I'm actually quite impressed with it, and I like it. It's got rollers on the end. It's light. You can, you can uh, collapse it, so you just have to fold up the legs. Well, they need a little more friction on them, so I probably need to tighten that up, and then that bends down like that out of the way. We have enough room that uh, we leave it up in this position. So if you're asking me if I would recommend this, yeah, yeah, I like it. And I have not had a problem with, with uh, the space, things falling in. Typically, by the time something is out there, it's either waste or it's a bigger piece that's being well, supported and, by the... And this piece, right? Yeah, and that's, I'm sure that's the reason why they have that section right there. So yeah, I've been quite impressed with that outfeed table. I know there's other brands that like it. I haven't used them. And as I said, you can make your own as well. But if you make your own and you just make a great big table, you don't have the luxury of being able to remove it if you need it. And if your space comes at a premium, then this is a, this is a great way to go. 
Super Dave wants you to know that he told Jake not to. <laughs> and once again, it's a good thing we didn't listen. Now that Super Dave has made his grand entrance, somebody is half of 80 as of two days ago? One day ago. Physically. Probably mentally mentally still only a quarter of the way. <laughs> if that. So Super Dave turned 40 on... Jake, tell me, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. And uh, so you guys can all write in there. Now, I've got to tell you who Super David is. Um, oh, that's a long Picture's story. I'll, right I'll give you a short version of it. Picture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I always have to introduce the voice. So we have quite a team here that we've put together to pull off this PHP. And uh, these are the two all-stars. So these are brothers, different mothers, different fathers, uh, military. This is retired Colonel Luther Sheely, U.S. Army, artillery. And this is Super David Benson. 17 years, combination of Navy and Army. I think he felt guilty being in the Navy and being stationed in Cuba and scuba diving and spearfishing all the time. He decided he probably had to do something real. So he joined the Army. And as a result of a tour in Afghanistan, took some shrapnel from an RPG to the, underneath his helmet and the side of his head, suffered a severe... TBI stands for traumatic brain injury. And uh, as a result of that, when he came home, was medically discharged, he came home and he liked to woodwork. He's really good. His old, I think it was a Sears, wasn't it? His old table saw that his grandfather or his father had given him. For whatever reason, the frequency when it would turn on would give him a debilitating headache. Much like the headache that he gives his wife now. And, uh, and he was just so depressed about the whole thing because he couldn't, uh, he couldn't do it. So he, he went out and he bought a cobalt, a cobalt hand plane. So that would be, I can't really find the equivalent of that, but that would just be a piece of garbage. And he couldn't get it to work. And I don't know, somehow he found me through YouTube and he called me up to ask me about this cobalt. And I said, well, have you got a, have you got a trash can anywhere close by? Throw it in it. And then I talked him into signing up and coming to our program. He came up, took our class when we were up in, up in uh, um, Niagara Falls. And uh, he just had his head down the whole time. He didn't, didn't really stand out. His dovetails were he stellar. Stood he stood out. Yeah, he stood out. He <laughs> was nothing super then. No, super came this after. Is, this was before the bus full of orphans. Yes, in Lake Ontario. Not to mention the straws that were pulled and from the, the environment. You got to hear that story someday. Anyway, so Dave came and went, did a lot of sweating because we worked them hard. And uh, I think the next time we were up there to teach, Luther ended up having to stay home at the last minute. Super Dave's wife had talked him into, we actually probably begged him to call me to see if we needed any help. So she he would leave. She wanted him out of the house. Get, her out of, get him out of the house. And he just, his timing was perfect. I mean, Jake and I were just thinking, how are we going to do this? There's just the two of us. And uh, because we had a bigger class than normal, I think it was the first time we went from 12 in the class to 14. And out of the blue comes this uh, email from David Benson. Uh, Rob, my wife, says, I'm not far away. I should be able to come help you if you want. Please say no. And I emailed back and I said, are you kidding me? What perfect timing. So he packed up the vehicle, loaded up his cooler with peanut butter sandwiches, literally, and came up. And uh, we just had a great time. He was, he was the life of the party. It really was. So he's now part of our program. Dave takes, Super Dave takes care of the uh, PHP classes that typically would run August, September, October. Luther takes care of their classes uh, April, May, June. No, May, June, July, sorry. And there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work. So he's the, uh, they're, the they're both the grease and the cogs that make everything work. So glad to have them. Kevin and uh, he also keeps Jake in shape and in line when he's not driving his tractor in circles around his yard. Kevin Burris is on. Hey, Kev. Uh, I could talk about these guys all night. Kevin Burris is, uh, is an amazing individual. EOD, Explosive Ordnance Disposal. His job that he did for 20, uh, 23 or 27, I can't remember, I think it was 23 years, was to dismantle bombs that were intended to blow up um, allies and uh, as a result of that lots of these explosives go off uh, when they're not supposed to so Kevin suffered tremendously as a result of this severe traumatic brain injuries 
uh, head to toe, actually. And uh, But now, Kevin, w whenever we do wood shows in Ontario, Kevin comes with us, demonstrates. And he's he's been one of the more prolific woodworkers as a result of coming to the program. I see his stuff being made all the time. So always good to have you, Kev. Say hello to your wife for me. And Kevin, Kevin's known his wife since they were in grade two, I think. Kevin is six foot three, and his wife is five foot three. It's quite an interesting picture. Anyway, anybody else? Charlie Ray. Charlie Ray. We're not going to get questions answered. I'll just tell you this. Charlie is salt. Charlie doesn't like me talking about him. But Charlie is the salt of the earth. And if we had more Charlies, this world would be a far better place. Charlie, you know, you know how good you are, and I appreciate knowing you. Thank you. Next question. Keep me coming. Uh, next question comes from Lincoln Palmer. Uh, Lincoln? Yep. As in your son? Yep. That's why really? I, that's why I picked this question. He says, how, how often are you tuning your saw, checking for square, etc.? Well, so now this is my shop, and that door is going to get locked. Nobody else is going to get in here. Which means if it's set up on Monday, when I come in Tuesday morning, I expect it to be the same way. How often do I check it? Never. If it's a really good saw, and this is the advantage, this is taking you back to another commercial for saw stuff. If it's a really good saw, it will stay in, in check. In other words, you set, that fence is so rugged that when you set that up, it would, you'd have to take a sledgehammer to it to knock it out of alignment. Uh, set up your 45 and your 90 on your blade, and that stays in alignment. Saws get dull. That just happens. Uh, there's a, now, I will say this, that sawdust sometimes collects in the area where when, when you wind your saw over as a trunnion moves like that, there's a, there's a bolt here that stops it at 45 degrees, and then there's another one on the other side that stops it at 90. And what I found on this is sawdust would build up on the head of that little button that goes up against the bolt, and then all of a sudden you're not getting a 45 degree stop anymore. So I've had to go in and, and adjust that. And I think they've improved the, that dust shroud, so I don't expect that to happen as much. So your answer is I check it when I set it up, and uh, unless I notice something happening, there'd be no reason to go back and check it again. That's why you want to buy a good saw. Next, Rick. Uh, next question comes from Norman Olson. He says, have, hey, you, Norman. have you ever cut coves using a table saw? And if so, is it a safe method? Yeah, yeah, I did. So um, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a nerve-wracking process. So you've got a blade that is a 10-inch diameter disc. And if you, were to, if you were to run a board, if you were to clamp a fence on and run a board this way across that blade, it would leave you with, and, and, and it's an infinite number of arcs, but you could actually cut an arc like that. You could cut a big arc like that. You could do anything you want. You have to do it in various stages. You can't just do one pass. You make a pass, raise it up a little, make another pass, raise it up a little, and you can do some interesting shapes. I made some crown molding that way. The problem is that you're going to get left with a very rough surface because it's the point tips of the blade that are doing this. And the amount of work that it takes to get rid of that is, is more, than, uh, more than offsets the advantage of being able to do something like that. Um, it's probably the biggest danger is trying to hog too much material at one time. Make sure your fence is secured so it does not move. And I would always use, I would always use a push stick like this, two of these, so that you're going over it. Because remember, it's going to be wanting to lift up, and you just you have to be careful. But you know what? I wouldn't recommend it for the simple reason that, like I said, the amount of work it takes to get rid of the tool marks afterwards negate any advantage of having the flexibility of cutting those shapes. What's going on, guys? Nothing. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, well, I'm waiting no for rest. the next question. You need another question? I do. Okay. Green screen. <laughs> this question comes from Gary Badger. Do you resharpen your Freud Hi, blades? Do I resharpen my what? Freud blades. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
um, we can probably get, uh, somebody once told me, I think you can get six or seven sharpenings. The problem is that most places that sharpen them so that they don't have to take a little bit and then check it and possibly have to go back in and do it again because one tooth didn't get sharpened enough. They'll take off a fair bit of carbide when they sharpen, usually more than they needed to, which eliminates or takes away from the life of the saw blade. But yeah, you can get at least six sharpenings out of them. Next. Okay. Uh, next one comes from... Have I, have I forgot? Did I, did I introduce Angie? I don't think so. I don't think I did, did I? Well, I did. I talked about what she does. This is Angie. This is Ken's cousin. Angie and her sister Lynn package up all of our t-shirts for us. Angie's coming to work here as soon as she's ready. We've got her, her locker out there. And she is part of our team. Thank you, Lynn and Angie. All right, Rick de Natali. Hi, Rick. Says, any tips on ripping French cleats? Any tips on ripping French cleats? Yeah. Uh, I don't know why you would need one. So uh, a French cleat is uh, essentially a dovetail. You've got one, you've got part of, part of it like this and the other part of it's like that. So one part, where have I, I've, you no, used it on that. That's, that's a metal one. It's not a real one. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that, Rick, because I can't. I mean, I can't think of why that would be. What would be unusual about that, unless you're thinking something different? So I'm going to ask you to give Frick a few more details. Go ahead, Frick. Next. Uh, Eddie Wolfries wants to know what's Eddie? the best method to remove resin from the blades. Well, you know what, they, 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 uh, that's a good question, really good. They make various products that you spray on, but you know what, take the blade into your sink, your kitchen sink, hot water, and an SOS pad, and the stuff will come right off. You don't have to use uh, harsh chemicals to do it. It's, it'll come off with hot water and an SOS pad. Really simple. Next. Uh, by the way, what he's talking about, especially if you, if, you, uh, if you cut a lot of pine, you'll get some really heavy resin buildup on your blade, which tends to add friction to it. And, uh, of course, the heat of the blade and the resin, and almost gets it cooked on there. But, yes, you can take it off. It's not hard. Go ahead, Frick. Uh, Don Hill in Texas wants to know Hi, Don. If, it, if it's worth restoring an old 1964 Craftsman table saw. Nope. No. Nope. I'll say it again. The number one, the number one cause of, of uh, DIY injuries that take people to the emergency room is the table saw. Uh, I, I said to someone this afternoon, I was talking about this. I said, uh, you have to, uh, up here in Canada, you have to... Uh, take courses in order to go and buy a shotgun. Yet anybody can walk into a store and buy a table saw and take it home. I had a neighbor, my last house, in our second to last house, who cut his finger off one Christmas Eve trying to open a can of frozen lobster on a table saw. Do the math on that one. Apparently he, had the, he was trying to spin it with the blade up. I, I, I don't even... He used to drink a lot. So... People can buy a table saw without any instruction whatsoever. They just walk in and get it and take it home. So that's why I say buy a saw stop. And you can hassle me all you want for promoting it. It is, it is a guarantee against injury. Why would you say no to it? It's the best saw. Let me let's do a little commercial. Okay. So SawStop developed this, is a physicist in Oregon that developed it. So tried to, tried to license the technology to all the big manufacturers. They all ended up turning it down because from what I remember reading in Woodshop News was that their lawyers told them that if you did this, you're admitting that what you've been selling is defective. So what they said is, okay, we'll make the best saw. So they took the best saws, and if you think about the Powermatic, I can't remember the number, the Unisaw and the General 350, I think it was called. Those were industry standards, just workhorses. 
So they made their top bigger than everybody else's. So a saw stop, and by the way, there's, uh, this is the industrial. There's the professional, the industrial, and there's a couple of other lighter contractor ones, but this is the industrial. It has a three horsepower motor. There's no reason to buy a five horsepower motor unless you're using your saw continuous all day. You're never gonna stall a three horse. So the top on this is 44 inches by 30 inches, bigger than all the rest. Um, I already talked about the dust collecting. That is better than any saw that I've ever seen. This has the best dust collecting. And you wouldn't think that's a big issue, but having that stuff coming back up in your face is not only annoying, it's somewhat dangerous. So this is a big, a big advantage. Changing the blade is, uh, like on most saws, is relatively easy. You have to change the cartridge, so that's a bit of a nuisance, but not for the protection it offers. Now, if you look down here, so the power transmission on most saws was done with two or three matched V-belts. And on a unisaw, the belts were only about that long, and it must have taken a quarter of a horsepower just to turn those. There was so much friction. And the reason why they had a triple belt was to prevent slipping. So what SawStop did is instead of doing that, they used a serpentine belt. So a little thin belt that, that requires very little to move, but with all these little grooves in there, you get all that extra traction without the extra, fr the extra friction of having to move these big um, stiff belts. So here's your trunnion. This is the part that, uh, that holds the motor and also holds the uh, shaft that the blade sits on. And it's just one big solid mass of cast iron. Works extremely well. Nice smooth operation. What else can I talk about this, Jake? I just, uh, I, uh, oh yeah, right here. Here's one more. I'll leave it at this. So on good saws, your blade and your motor are attached to the cabinet. The top sits on top of it and you have to line it up. So your blade has to be parallel to these miter gauge slots. Now, on my Unisaw, and that's the only one I'm gonna reference, there are four bolts underneath, two in the front, two in the back. And in order to line this up, you would loosen those four bolts, and then you played that game with a mallet where you would tap, 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 and try to get it so that it was perfectly lined up and it wasn't easy. I would have a miter gauge in here with a blade up high and a little piece of rod or something on there and you would check this tooth and then you would move it over this side and check that tooth and it was a, it was a process. And then you would go in and try to tighten them all up and hopefully it wouldn't shift. So what did these guys do? Well, they too have four bolts. Two here, two there. But then they have a pin. They have a single pin right underneath here. A pivot pin. And then on the outside of the cabinet back here and on the outside of the cabinet back there, see if you can see them. Mm -mm. Can't get at them? No, you won't be, I won't be able to see it. Well, there it is right there. But there's two pins that are mounted horizontally. And what you do is you loosen one and advance the other. And what that does is it moves your table like this, but tremendous amount of control. And you get it where you want it. You lock, the, you lock that. You tighten up those four bolts. Bob's your uncle. Just somebody didn't, didn't just accept status quo and said, well, maybe there's a better way to do it. And they came up with the better way of doing it. Great system. Dean wants to know if it's a three horsepower or a 1.5 or which one you recommend. Three, well, so if you're, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to invest in it, like I said, avoid the five horsepower. There's no reason to get five horsepower. I build furniture. We cut just about everything in here that you would cut. We've never, you would never come close to stalling it. 1.75 is an option. Three horse, five horse, seven and a half even. Um, I would say 1.75. Eh. In that case, I'm going to go a little bit more and I'm going to buy the three. If you don't have 220, actually, I think even the 1.75 is designed to run on 220, but it may not be. So if, you're, if you don't have 220 in your shop, then you may have to go with a smaller horsepower. But my recommendation would be buy the three horsepower motor. Save yourself some money, the five is more expensive and you don't need the extra horsepower. I'll also mention this too, because you won't read this anywhere. Sooner or later, you're gonna run a piece of wood through this that's wet, or you're going to touch the part of your miter gauge or something's gonna happen, you're gonna trip it. 
On a three horsepower motor, this is just from my experience. Now we've tripped, I'll bet you we've tripped 15 of these in the life of our, that we've had at the tool. Usually you can salvage the blade. You would just take it out. I take a brass hammer and knock that piece of aluminum out. Occasionally you might've broken a tooth, but on a three horsepower, there's not enough torque there to tear the shoulders off. So I've almost always been able to save the blade. But on a five horsepower, you've got that extra weight, momentum of that bigger motor, and that usually ends up tearing some shoulders off and there's your blade gone. So three horse. Next, Fred. Okay, next question. Frank, switch camera. I can't. Why not? It's not working. Oh, my Frank. <laughs> uh, this one comes from Jeff Thompson. Hi, Jeff. He says, do you have any tips for getting accurate cuts with a fence on a vintage 10-inch Craftsman table saw that would really help me don't have the cash to upgrade my table saw? That's from Jeff in Illinois. Tips on, say that again. Uh, tips on getting accurate cuts with a fence on a vintage 10-inch Craftsman table saw. Okay, so um, the, the only other fence I can show you here, because it's, it's almost always the fence's fault. Jake, over here. So this is the fence that used to be on the, uh, on the Unisaw. It was, a, it was the, called the uh, Jet Lock, I think. I think, if I remember correctly. I actually liked it. Nice thing about this is when you lock it here, it locks here first. So same, kind of the same concept as the Unisaw in that it's a big T. Locks here first, and then it also tightens up out here. So it holds that in place so that it doesn't move. This one hasn't been set up, but it's on a bandsaw. But I really liked about this fence is had this micro adjust. So you put that in there, and you, there's teeth. There's teeth cut in under, on the underside of this big heavy tube, and this little, uh, saw, this little gear engages, and it allows you to make a really fine adjustment. So I don't know what your fence looks like on your old Sears Craftsman, but... If you have a fence that doesn't automatically correct itself when you adjust it here, that's not worth having. That's, unless it's repairable, that is not worth having. You can all, they have aftermarket fences, so you may have to spend the money and get some aftermarket, an aftermarket fence, providing your saw is a decent saw. I'm not familiar with the, I'm not familiar with the saw you're talking about, but is it, when I say, is it a decent saw, well, you know, if you grab hold of the blade, you shouldn't be able to move anything. You want to be able to line it up so that it's parallel to your miter gauge slots. Um, other than that, as long as it's got enough power that it can make a cut through a board without stalling on you. If, if, and your top, your, you want your top to be flat too. I mean, it's a lot of the old cast iron ones. I had, actually, I had, did have another side. I had an old beaver with a cast iron top that was open, had open slots in it. And I thought it was worth salvaging until somehow I ended up putting a straight edge on there and that top was concave like that. That's not worth working with. That's garbage. Can't remember whatever happened to it. So if your saw checks out and it looks like it's salvageable and it's a good saw, then you've got to look at your fence and you're probably best off to buy an aftermarket fence because anything less than a good fence is just dangerous. The first time that gets set up and it's not perfectly parallel and it's closing in on the blade and you start pushing a board through it and all of a sudden it binds, you, pa you panic a little bit and when people panic, they tend not to grab harder, they tend to pull back. Now all of a sudden that piece of wood doesn't have anybody holding it and the backside of the blade catches it and throws it back at you. No. I'd bet I, if, if, that, if you don't have the money to fix it, get yourself a handsaw. You'll be a lot happier. <laughs> Jake's getting. I got resting on resting on there, Jake. It's like really? it's really choppy. It's it's working, but it he's like skipping really bad. I'm not sure why. Who's skipping? Your dad. Like it's uh, not it's not smooth. What's wait? What's not smooth? The picture. Like oh, you mean off of that on the, camera? On the second camera, yeah. Can you can you rest it on there somehow? Okay, hey, Frick, next question. All right, next question comes from uh, Bert Rodriguez. He just wants to know if the outfield ta outfeed table legs on the saw stop are adjustable. Yes. 
Yes, there's there's a little bolt, there's little uh, feet underneath that screw in, and then there's a locking nut on there. So yeah, you can adjust them to whatever you need. And if you need, it's a common size, so if you needed to, you could even put a longer one in there. Next. Also, Don says I I don't have any hair, so I have to show him that I still have hair. He thinks I went. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brandon Zane from Connecticut. He says, any advice on getting scratches out of the tabletop? Well, I was just, well, you were, we were over here. I, this is my, this is brand new saw and I've already got scratches in here. I don't know where it came from, but, uh, sometimes you pick up a piece of lumber and I didn't realize it was sitting on the floor and there's been some, uh, there's been some little bits of rocks in it. So yeah, it's going to happen anyway. You don't want you don't want anything that leaves a burr, and this one has a burr on it. So I need to take something on to that, whether I, it's a file that I lay flat on there, or something. But that's going to scratch wood if I don't. So I'll show you what I mean. If it's really bad, if it's a if it's a gr if it's a gouge and it's just a hole, leave it alone. Nothing you can do with it. If it's a gouge that has raised material on the side, then you gotta go in and fix it. So if I could set my file on there like this, make more scratches, but at least I got rid of those. This is terrible, but you know what? It's gonna look worse than this in a year's time. That seems to be gone. Every once in a while, I'll run my hand all over there because you'll notice you'll be running a board and you've got a mark. Where's this coming from? And you'll find that there's a right around the, uh, the throat plate sometimes just something gets dinged or along here or along the front and it leaves a mark. And that, that little raised area will end up, end up leaving a gouge in your board. I also just noticed that one that wing is, is uh, sticking up in the air a little bit. to loosen it it's not moving yeah don't don't uh, it's not a piece of jewelry but make sure there isn't any raised pieces of metal on there that'll mark up your board next Rick okay next question are you reading ones that were mailed in or, or that they came in uh no I'm a mix most most of them are from the chats actually because okay. I didn't get them back from Luther yet Luther is on with us finally though he just joined us Finally figured out the uh, computer. Anyways, uh, Dave Ducharme. Hi, Dave. So Dave's a good friend. Dave's been, uh, Dave's a huge supporter. Dave's been to our class. Dave's vet, he didn't come as one of our combat wounded vets, but Dave is a vet himself. And Dave is uh, a huge supporter of the Purple Heart Project. So thank you, Dave. What's your question? He says, when aligning the miter slot to the blade, is it necessary to check with the blade both in the vertical and 45 degree positions? No, just in the vertical. Unless there's something, there's something, if it's not, if it goes out of whack when you lay it over at 45, there's obviously something wrong with your saw. But no, raise your, raise your saw up all the way. The only tip that I would give you on this is bring your saw blade all the way up. And then mark the tooth that you're using and then use that tooth on the backside as well instead of using a one of the tooth over here. And that's just... A way to eliminate any possible error. So I would get a tooth that was sticking out on this side, like that one, and put a mark, put a mark with a felt tip or something on there, and then move that over to the back side and check it from over there. And make sure you don't have any play. You don't want play in your miter slot. So if you put your miter gauge in there, you shouldn't be able to move it. See how that moves? I need to go in there and fix that. And fixing that means taking a, uh, the newer ones actually have uh, a little thing, a, a screw that you can push out on the side. But what this needs, I'll do it. This needs a, a hammer and a punch. And a file. And a file, true. Have we got a pointed one, Jake? Well, this one's pretty much wrecked, but I'll just turn it into one. I'm, I'm going to put a point on this.
That would actually do better if I put it in the drill. Ah, I can't get it. Can I slide that down? Trying to get the jaws. Come on. No, because it's not. Uh... Okay, I'll go back to doing it by hand. Hopefully that's hard enough. So I've got a point on there. Now, how about a hammer? I would prefer one a little bit bigger, but this will do. And I don't want to use my table saw for this. So I'll come over here. And what I'm going to do is peen on the bottom there? No, on the side. Well, because I'd rather have, I'd rather have the, uh, this sitting on something secure. Now when you do that, that mushrooms and leaves a little bit of metal sticking out. It's odd that that would work first time. No, I still got a little bit to move. Give that another whack. Oh, go in the center, go, in, go between the two. Well, I didn't want to have it done as a dozen of them, but I have to. Now, normally I would come back in and I'd file that, but that seems to be pretty good. So I got eliminated that slop by just... In the front, too. I, yeah, I don't feel any... Oh, no. What am I talking about? It's back here. The front's got a lot in it. That's still moving a lot. I didn't hit that hard enough. I wish I had a better way of holding this. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's the right height. You know what, Jake? Well, that T slot in this one is bigger. Is uh, no, the T slot is that is so high. I think I'm actually sitting below the. Uh, I am. Oh, it's sitting. You mean you need to be doing it higher? Yeah, I need to come closer to the top side. It's actually falling down in the T slot. Did he see, is he making remarks about my hammer? Tell him I don't require a mall to put my dovetails together. 
He may want to think about that. That's my dovetail assembly hammer. The better you are, the smaller the hammer. All right, I can live with that. Now, if that, if that got to be tight, I would just come in and I would just file it off a little bit until eventually when it sat down there, that was just right, meaning it moved, but it didn't wiggle. What was the question? Neither do I, but I know it led us there. Okay, next one, Frick. Uh, next one comes from Stan Hawkins. Hi, Stan. And he was wondering if you could describe a run out on a table saw. Describe it? Yep. Where's that over there? The, uh, you know, that we check measure run out with. Dial indicator. Dial indicator. So run out is when there's a slop in your blade. So somewhere, either a bearing is bad or just poor manufacturing. But, um, and describe it on a drill press, but this doesn't quite apply. So when this blade is spinning, it should stay in that path. If it, if it moves laterally, then instead of getting a nice clean kerf, you're going to get a rough kerf. Now, a lot of things can contribute to that. In fact, oh, I remember seeing Rex was cutting something, and uh, he was binding up the blade so bad, and you look down, and that blade was moving. It looked like a half an inch in either direction. Rather scary to look at. So that's why they have these slots. You see these little laser-cut slots in here? They're all over the saw. Because as the saw heats up and expands, if those expansion slots weren't there, the saw plate would go out of flat and it would run out. So those help prevent that from happening. So you want that blade to run on that path and not move side to side at all. And if you're worried about it, dial indicators aren't that expensive. It has a magnetic base. You clamp it on there and you set it on your blade right here. And that point that you're setting is attached to a dial that measures in thousandths of an inch. And as you spin your blade around, you should watch that dial and the dial shouldn't move or very little. Now, if you have run out, and it's because of uh, maybe your blade isn't stiff enough, you can buy blade, um, what are they called? Can't remember the name. But th you essentially, they're, they're just a big washer. So this washer is two and a half inches in diameter. And you can probably get them three, maybe even three and a half inches in diameter. So you're adding a big steel plate on either side that is just going to help to stabilize that. Sharp, a good blade and a sharp blade is going to prevent most of that problems. If your run out is into your saw, then you probably don't have a very good saw. Or your bearings are bad. Bearings are very inexpensive and they're not that difficult to replace. This stuff's... This stuff isn't rocket science. It's, um, it's pretty simple. The technology, for the most part, hasn't changed in the last... Well, the shakers invented the table saw, and that was back in the 1800s, so... We're still using the same stuff. Next question, Frick. William A. Watch our time. It's quarter two. So yep. make sure you've registered for the draw. Uh, just before I get them to read the next question tonight, we're giving away that uh, jack plane. I should take this out of the box so you can see it. That way you can get a little more excited about it. Surprised somebody didn't ask. Looks exactly like a Wood River, but we determined that it's not the same because the casting is not the same. And I tasked Ken with, well, there's the, there's the proof of how well it works. Ken always does that. So it's ready to go. So we'll find it at home. Number six, 18 inches long, two and three inch wide blade. Go ahead, Frick. William McAdoo in South Texas. Hey, William. He wants to know the pros and cons of a sliding table versus a cabinet saw. Uh, okay. Well, the probably... The, so what he's talking about, in case you don't know, a sliding table. So what they do is they make some tables that have a big... Yeah, and actually, they can act, an af, there's an aftermarket part as well, part available. And what, instead of... I use a sled or a miter gauge, but a part of the table... And the ones that are actually built this way have a big, huge arm, 
and you put your sheet goods on here and you slide the entire table by the blade. Uh, Altendorf comes to mind, which is a brand. I think that saw cost, oh, I don't know, forty or $50,000. And uh, it was great, very precise, but it took a huge footprint. So to have a saw like that would almost occupy this room from side to side and probably lengthwise. So the, the uh, cost would be prohibitive. The space required would be prohibitive. And if you're running a small shop, even a small uh, professional shop, I don't think you need it. I think you can get by with a sled. I prefer the sled because then I can control the accuracy of it because I make it myself. I, so I've never bought one of them. And I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of some of the aftermarket ones that you add to it. I've seen them. Yeah, they seem to be a little bit light. But again, they take up so much room because they occupy the left side of your saw, which is where you typically are walking front to back, getting around your saw. My, that's the biggest disadvantage I see. Frick? Okay, John Bees uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. Hi, John. What are the pros and cons of having a router installed in your table saw? None. I, uh, I had in my last one. So what he's talking about is you've got this big table space off to the right, and rarely are you using that part of your saw. Shoot. So I cut a big circle out of here, and I mounted a router table. And what's nice is you get to use the same fence. If, it's, if you do need this part of the table for the saw, you simply drop it out of sight so it's not in the way. You, you've, you would have seen it on my other saw in the other shop. And I'll probably, I may add one into this too because they've beefed this up from the last model. So no, it's a, a, good, way to it's a good way to utilize the space that otherwise doesn't get used. And you already have a fence built in, so big plus. Do it. David in Austin, Texas is asking, how much horsepower do you need for hardwoods? Uh, three horse, I would just say three horse is the standard. It'll cut anything. You can, we, we've never stalled this saw, whether we're ripping maple or oak, white oak or pine. Um, three horse, fine. I don't think you need anything more than that. Next, Frick. Don in Gaster, Michigan. Hi, hey, Don. What is your favorite table saw hack or jig? Uh, sliding table. Yeah, sl my sliding table that, my sled, yeah, sliding table, you got me thinking. My sled that uh, I'll have here in the next, we got, I've got to make one to fit. They, by the way, we, did we try to bring that one over here? We, we tried another. So we've got two of these in the other shop, and the, and the sled that we made for one does not fit the other one. So there's just, a, that shows you how precise you can make them. So, uh, and we did a video, I think, on... On making the sled, or was that in the online workshop? So we have an online workshop that you're, well, you're welcome to check out for a month for free. Just get a hold of Super Dave. He'll set you up. And we, we show you how to make those. But the sled would be, the, the sled would be my most used. And I'm going to give you number two, even though you didn't ask. I make a sleeve out of one-inch MDF that fits over top of, my, of this fence that sits up about that high. And I really like it, too, because if you're doing something like cutting a tenon on the end of this, you don't have a whole lot of surface area. But with that sleeve that sits on there, now you've got up this high, and you've got lot, a lot more surface area. You can also, you can also clamp, clamp a piece of... You can clamp a piece of wood this way that rides on top of that auxiliary fence and that prevents your board from tipping like that. So that's number one and two. Next, Frick. See if we can squeeze in a whole bunch more in the last six minutes. Uh, Daniel Lubick in Virginia. Hi, hey Dan. Says, I don't have a bandsaw, but like to get my own lumber from logs. Is there a way to process wood with a Scott. table saw? What's his last name? Oh, uh, yeah, I, he, and I know who you mean, Scott. All right. Daniel. Say it again. Yeah, but he goes by Scott. Okay. I don't have a bandsaw, but like to get my own lumber from logs. Is there a way to process wood with a table saw? Uh, bandsaw is so much better, so much easier. 
trying to process a log. Remember what I said? You need, you really, to be safe, you really need to have that board laying nice and flat on your table. Bandsaw is a little bit different, but uh, I wouldn't, I don't think I would try processing lumber, especially green lumber. You start cutting into a log and that thing's gonna pinch in on your blade. That's not something that I would wanna do. Nice to see you too, by the way. Walt Liggett in Hickory, North Carolina. Says, what is the strongest? Hi, what is the strongest and thinnest material to make the bottom of a sled out of? Also, best runner material. Um, because I use a big cleat on the front and on the back as a fence on the front and as a support on the back, because you're going to cut all the way through this, right? So you could get away with half inch MDF. The cleats would hold it flat, and uh, of course, the thinner the the thinner the base is, the more capacity you're afforded on your blade. Your blade comes up three inches. If you use one inch MDF, now your cutting capacity is two inches. So half inch would be probably the smallest I would go. Megan, any more vets? Oh, sorry. Next. Rapid fire, Frick. Rapid fire for the last five minutes. Uh, Forrest in Savannah, Georgia. Hey, Forrest. Says, how realistic is it to have most shop equipment mobile and reposition the needed tools for the task at hand? Well, of course, there's nothing like having stationary tools that, and the reason why they're accurate is they're not moved about. If you have to move them about, well, you have to. But somebody asked how often do you check your saw? If I was moving it about, I would probably have to be checking it a lot more frequently. Just that setting and moving, that's always going to just create a bit of havoc. Especially on something like this. You've got two skinny little legs out at the end of that table. Well they can be easily get knocked out of whack, particularly if you're moving it around. So in place is always best. If you have to move it around, then you're going to have to make sure that you check it before you use it. Inspect what you expect is always my motto. Next, Frick. Les Nightingale in Enterprise, Oregon. Hi, Les. Can users sharpen their own table saw blades? And if so, what is the method you recommend? Well, yeah, you can, but I mean, why? Uh, most saw sharpening, what do we pay? Do you remember? 14 or 16. So in, in US dollars, we would pay about $11 to have a, saw, a blade sharpened. The guy does it, is design, he's set up to do carbide. He, it brings it back and it's as sharp as it was when it was new. I'm, uh, I got a lot of other stuff to do to bother trying to set up for something that might be done once every six months. So I say, you know, that's not a place where your, uh, your time is well spent. Get it sent, even if you have to mail it to somebody to have it done, you're better off than trying to do it yourself. Not to mention the learning curve. How many blades are you willing to wreck in the process of learning? Next, Rick. Uh, David D. in Glen Ridge, New Jersey. Hi, David. Can, you ad can Rob address the safety importance of a splitter when purchasing a new or used table saw? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just, I'm just so that we can get in a few more questions. Go back to the first part. We, we actually covered this in great detail, the first part of tonight. Next, Frick. Uh, Fabio in Rochester, New York. What hey, are Fabio. You, what are your thoughts on thin kerf table saw blades? Yep, same thing, Fabio. At the beginning of this, we talked about the thin kerf extensively. Go back and check that out. Thanks. Next. Um, I'm out of questions. <laughs> What is the best saw blade to use for all around use? Um, most people would say a combination blade, but you know what? I would probably say a rip blade because a nice sharp rip blade will actually do a really good job cross cutting and it does a really good job ripping. A cross cut blade does a wonderful job cross cutting, but does a lousy job ripping. So, and a combination blade does both so so. I, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm off the charts on that as far as opinions that other people would have saying a rip blade would be my, if I was only going to go with one, that's what I would use. Okay, I think, is that it? Yep. Okay. So make sure your name's in. You only got a second. Frick's, Frick's compiling the names for the draw. What, by the way, where are we tonight? How many gifts are we giving? Uh, 1,555. Okay, so tonight we'll give away this, we'll give away the plane. And we'll give a, I, I, well, we've got to stick to our guns. We said every 1,000. So we're giving away the plane, and it'll come with a T-shirt 
and the video on setting up and using a hand plane. We're also going to give a, we're also going to give away three either dead cats or the new golf shirts, your choice, both for what you want and the color. And Frick, are you ready? Uh, I believe I am, unless you want to give people just a couple more minutes. Yep. Big thank you to Moose for supporting what we do. For Megan for being here and keeping track of the vets. She looks a little tired. She's got off of work. She's worked all day. And she has to come here and do this. Jake behind the camera, who's having a sore back issue. Frick over there behind the green screen, who uh, keeps us online. <laughs> Luther in, in California for doing what he does. He does a tremendous amount behind the scenes. Super Dave for always being there. All of the vets that have been to our class and any vet out there, you served your country. We owe you a huge debt. And uh, my family for being supportive and giving me every second Saturday night to do this. And for all of those of you who watch and donate and contribute and help us spread the word, I tip my hat to you. Angie, Ken, Ken's at home, he's on there as well. And uh, the list goes on. Sorry if I missed anybody. Okay, Frick. Wait, just give me two seconds. I'm just adding the last three names. Entry is now closed. Chances of winning tonight are 591. All right, let's do this. I'm trying a new method. We're not using Jake's camera to look at the screen, so let's just make sure this works. Okay. All right. So all the names are So in. first three are dead cats or, or the new golf shirts, Purple Heart golf shirts. Yep. Our first winner is... Jack Billiter in Florida. Hey, Jack. I'm guessing you're going to take a golf shirt. Congratulations. Number two is Chris Goodwin in Santa Clara, Utah. Chris, Santa Clara, is that high or low? Oh, that'll be a golf shirt. I lived around there. Uh, number three, Larry Baumler in Vermont. Not too Larry far. Larry Vermont, that could be a golf, that could be a dead cat. Especially he's up in the mountains, in the White Mountains. And who's getting our plane tonight? Grand prize winner is... Ken Shaw in Brantford, Ontario. Hey, Ken Brantford. Congratulations. We'll put that in the mail to you Monday morning. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your support. Hope this is helpful to you. We'll be back in two weeks. I think, now, I think our topic in two weeks is just going to be open questions. Um, ask us anything, anything woodworking related. Have a wonderful two weeks. Hope summer has hit you, and we will see you in two weeks' time.